Yeah, uh, is it on? So I'd like to thank first uh, Dr. Ignacio Echeverra for a nice introduction and also for giving me an opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'll, uh, <coughs> the uh, title of my, the topic of my talk is cytoskeletal dynamics and, and cell motility and I'll try to explain what are the problems in that area and, and I'm in computational, uh, I work in computational biophysics and I'm a theorist so the uh, question is what someone like me could help to contribute to understanding in this field that just a few years ago was purely biological and only biologists were working in the field. And, and hopefully from what I'll tell you, you'll see that a new way of um, working in many areas in, in biology is bringing together biologists and theorists, physicists, mathematicians, chemists, and solving these complex problems together because they really uh, require a truly multidisciplinary approach. And before I go on, uh, just in case if I don't uh, get to my final slides uh, and run out of time, I'd like to first acknowledge uh, postdocs and students in my group who have contributed to our efforts in this area. Uh, Dr. Pavel Zhrilovlev was uh, one of my first graduate students and he did uh, an amazing job publishing in many areas and now he is a postdoctoral researcher with Dave Tormelai at uh, here at UMD. Uh, Yu Hang Lan was my first postdoc and now he's an assistant professor at Tsinghua University in Physics. Uh, Dr. Long Kua Hu, who uh, I don't have his photo, um, is, so that's not really him, but, uh, um, but uh, he, he's a postdoctoral researcher in my group and he did uh, his PhD with uh, Alexander Grossberg. And uh, Maria Minakova was a graduate student who recently graduated and doing a, doing a postdoc with Tim Alston at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So um, here is a, a movie of a cell that's moving on a substrate and uh, we have uh, many uh, researchers on this campus uh, who do lots of exciting experimental work on studying cell motility like Dr. Wolfgang Glosert and R. Peter Portaya and the, when they do studies like that this, these are kind of things that they could observe which is they see a cell moving and then they often can attach fluorescent proteins to various proteins like G actin or other proteins involved in cell motility. And then as, as the cell moves and the dynamic progresses, you see that it's not a static picture, that it, not that simply it moves, but there are lots of chemical and, 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 and mechanical things going on inside the cell. So uh, another thing to realize is that your, um, your typical notion of motion, for example, how the cars move and so on, this is probably not how the microscopic objects, micron-sized objects like cells are going to move because the Reynolds number or, the, or the, the, uh, the effect of friction that the cells would feel is enormous compared to what we feel. It's just like if everything here was filled with honey. So the way that they operate and, and the scale of molecules and so on, it's so different that it's not necessarily that our everyday intuition of how things move mechanically has almost any relevance to how it happens on the micro scale. So, so that's why it's an interesting question. And, and clearly it's a question as was, was the title of my talk. And I don't have many answers. I'll, I'll, I, I, we've done some things that other people have done a lot more. But still we, we collectively don't have really great answers to how cells move as a completely solved problem. So what I'd like to get you just interested in this and, and maybe read more and, 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 and or maybe get get involved and uh, if you are not already doing research in this area. Um, so if you take, um, although the title of my talk was very general, uh, cells of lower organisms like bacteria and the cells of higher organisms like us, they move completely by different principles. And, <laughs> and there are people that are interested in bacterial motion and so on. Uh, and I won't go into that. You probably know things like flagella beating and, or, and swimming. Um, but uh, the cells inside us, and we have uh, trillions of or billions of cells moving in us right now. All, all the, all, they, they, they do move all the time. We need it for everyday uh, physiology. Those cells uh, are moving based on actin cytoskeletal dynamics. And that's what I'll tell you a little bit uh, during the remainder of my talk. So actin, and, and I'll show you more about actin, but actin is a protein 
And this protein, think of it like it's a globular, like a little Lego block. You can see some pictures there. And then these Lego blocks then start to form filaments. And these filaments then can form either one-dimensional bundles or they can form three-dimensional meshes. And, and because of, think of it this way, that if, if this is a three-dimensional mesh, think of it that you have like this elastic beams connected in some sense. But it's not, again, the macroscopic anal analogy can be very misleading because these things are very dynamic. It's, it's very thermal. The thermal forces are exciting everything. It's also very chemically dynamic. So there are chemical reactions, there are enzymatic reactions, there is signaling. So these are kind of things that we sort of, you don't have a Boeing aircraft with lots of chemistry going on in terms of how it's being, uh, except for the, maybe the burning of fuel, you don't have lots of chemistry controlling it. But in the cell, that's how it's controlled. Hundreds of chemical reactions are controlling this dynamics and motion. So this is one cartoon. If you wanted to sort of get sort of the big picture, and, and as usual with biology, you really, you really never know if this is true, at least at this point where we are. Uh, but this is what people, some people think, and many people think there's a good, reasonable starting point at least to think about it. This is if you put a cell on a substrate, this is how people think it happens, is that you put a cell in the substrate and it could, for example, spontaneously polarize, so it has front and a back. And then when it does it, actin filaments, they polymerize in the front, and then when they polymerize, they push the, they push the front forward. And then after that, there are molecules called adhesion molecules, like glue. So they can glue the forward to the substrate. And then there are ectomyosin stress cables that go from the front to the back. And then when these stress cables contract, then basically the back of the cell then moves to the front. And then the cycle repeats many times. So of course the question is how this whole thing is organized. And when do the ectomyosin cables know when they should contract? And I mean, there are lots of questions starting, how does the, why the cell polarizes? Why, instead of being uh, completely symmetric in that sense, why does it decide to go in one direction versus another? So there are lots of questions for, as I said, for most of it, we don't really have complete answers, but also there are lots of ideas. Now, I'm starting to get a little bit into de more details. Um, and here you can see that if you start to use things like electron microscopy, where you freeze the cell and and, and, and then study that relatively high resolution, then you start to see pictures either like this or, or, or you see it there that inside the cell there's this actin mesh. It's a pretty complicated irregular structure. It's irregular on one hand, although it, there is some regularity. For example, the connections between branches seem to be centered around 70 degrees, although it doesn't have to be exactly 70 degrees. And there is some even sort of discussion about this whole branching issue and so on. And, uh, and then you can try to look at this actin mesh in different parts of the cell and, 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 and see, and again, it's not homogeneous through the, throughout the cell. There's a cell cortex where you have lots of actin polymerized. There are parts where there's less actin. And also there's even a question of polarity that this actin filaments, I'll show you in a second, they have a direction. They will think of it like plus and minus direction. And, and, and in, in sense of that direction, they can be either polarized or not polarized. So they're even just structurally what they are it's an interesting question. Now, this is a slide that would uh, probably make physicists give up on, on this uh, project or, or in trying to understanding uh, maybe this phenomenon. The, this is many years of biochemical work by many labs. And it represents, as a cartoon, probably a small fraction of what goes on there in terms of regulation of this process. So, uh, why I'm saying, uh, pointing out uh, that physicists might not like this is that there are so many things going on, there are so many chemicals that it's not clear if there's a, some simple picture, simple model you can put there and, and this will explain everything. So it could be that the real answer is something that chemists do, deal with all the time. That it's really messy, really complicated, you have to go through the, all the details and then at the end, piece by piece, understand everything and put it together it's, it's, there is no shortcut to the understanding. So, of course, we all hope that that's not, it's not true and there are some underlying simple principles and this is just a decoration, but at this point, it's not clear that, that if, if that's the case. So, as I said, this, is, this slide is a few years old, so I'm sure that uh, there are actually a lot more players now that people would argue should be on this slide. But the main idea is that, again, you see the actin uh, polymers being, uh, actin molecules polymerizing, and branching, 
And, 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 and as you see, there are so many players that all they do is control this polymerization because, again, you want your cell to go in one place, not another place, and, and so on, and, and also control cell shape. And the, there are two key things that you want to do in terms of controlling polymerization. One is, if you already have a filament, this filament grows. So you can control the speed of growth. You can accelerate growth. You can stop growth. So it's almost like you have a brake or you have an accelerator pedal that you have on the filament end for on each individual filament. And each individual filament is regulated separately from other filaments. So, so it's, it's very fine regulated. Also, there is branching that if you have a filament, then a molecule can come and dock to this filament and start a daughter filament at an angle. So that gives you a branch structure. And, and then on top of that, there are things like aging. We, we just heard a beautiful talk about aging. This is a different kind of aging. So it turns out that I, I just kept telling you that there is actin, but this actin can be in different states, and I'll tell you about it just in a second. So this actin can age, as it, so it polymerizes, but then it ages, and, and that leads to older, funny enough, the older actin filaments can break more easily. So, so that sort of leads to, uh, to um, uh, recycling and so on, and that's really needed, because if actins kept polymerizing, then you'll run out of the pool. So, uh, there are lots of proteins that regulate too. They cross, they cut the filaments and, and accelerate. Actually, the aging in vivo in cells is a lot more accelerated compared to if you do an in vitro experiment in a test tube. So this is, as they say uh, in, uh, I guess, with Microsoft uh, things, that it's not a bug, it's a feature. So, so you do need accelerated aging for this uh, cell, for the actin dynamics to really properly working in, in the context of and in vivo um, uh, 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 cytoskeletal dynamics. So this is going one scale down further. Now we're looking at a single molecule. So you see a G-actin molecule. It's 45 kilodalton. It, it's, it's a nice looking molecule. There's an ATP, uh, ATP chemical moiety in it, which is the currency, energetic currency of the cell. And this is where the aging comes in, is that ATP can be in multiple states and two Typical states are ATP and ADP. And it turns out that this actin, in addition to being a structural block for polymerization and giving it mechanical filaments, it's also an enzyme. And it can internally catalyze this ATP. It's a hydrolase. So it can catalyze this ATP into ADP. And, so, and, and because this is very small, it's not a macroscopic machine. It's a microscopic thing. That this catalysis is actually, is actually stochastic. It, it doesn't have an it doesn't happen according to a timer, but its time is distributed. It happens stochastically. So, so there are lots of interesting things going on. Um, in addition, actin polymerizes not into a single, single line of actins, like beads in a string, but it's a double helical filament. So, 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 so there are two filaments that are interwoven together into a right-handed helix. And because it's a helix, like DNA, then it's going to have polarity, that it has a plus end and a minus end and clearly they play a big role. Um, so it turns out that when people, like if you have a piece of actin filament, clearly you could have polymerization on both ends, and also you can have depolymerization on both ends. It turns out because of polarity, that's very different, that the, the polymerization on the plus end, it's much more accelerated, and the red molecules that you see, they, they are the ATP actin molecules that dock, and, 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 and when the eight, when the G-actin is in the ATP form, the bond between neighboring G-actins is thought to be strong and it's hard to break. But then when time goes on and the actin itself uh, catalyzes the ATP to ADP, then you have G-actin ADP and the bonds become weak and you accelerate depolymerization. So you get something that's called treadmilling that typically an G-actin ATP that's prevalent in solution polymerizes on the right-hand side. And then as time goes on, then the bonds become weak, it depolymerizes. So you could, for example, if it's not labeled, you could see a piece of actin filament and you think it's doing nothing. But if you labeled a few, you'll see that there is constant treadmilling. So, and it's all driven by ATP, meaning that it's all driven by external energy source. So if you turn off the feeding of energy into the system, then all these beautiful structures will just disappear. So, so they are not really in that sense, uh, thermodynamic structures or, or in thermodynamic equilibrium, but they are highly regular structures and processes, but they are very far from equilibrium. All right, this is one more slide to show that even, you know, as, as with fractals, like if you want to zoom in and look at any detail, you'll just get things more and more complicated. This is just 
one slide to show this is the, not something that we actually worry about too much because, as I said, there's too much detail even for us um, to, to, to try to model and so on. But, but I was telling you that there's a molecule that could come and dock to the filament side and branch a daughter filament. That sounds like a simple action, right? When biologists start to look into it, it turns out that there are like, I don't know, here there are 11 steps. And, and each of this has a kinetic rate constant and, 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 and probably even this is oversimplified. So it just shows that, I mean, it depends what's your level of ambition in terms of trying to understand this. That, uh, I mean, at some point in the future, probably this all will be modeled uh, with all the little steps. But at this point, I think we just want to probably get at least the big picture right. Now, the second thing I want to tell you about is the coupling between mechanics and chemistry, which is, uh, there are two names for it. It's called mechanochemistry as a new sort of science. And there's also mechanobiology, so both terms are used. And, uh, and, and it's very interesting because we sort of tend to think about chemistry and biology as different, or chemistry and mechanics as different things. But there are processes, like in, the, in, in this case, in the actin um, filament growth, where they get coupled. For example, one of the, here's one of the following examples, that if you have a filament and this filament is pushing against the membrane, then because of that, if, there is a, if I put, for example, a load on top of the membrane that it's pushing really hard, then there's no space for a new monomer to come in and to polymerize. That means that I have to wait for some spontaneous fluctuation to open this up space so it can polymerize, which means that if I push harder, I will decrease the rate of polymerization. And it turns out it's an, like in a simple model, it's an exponential decrease. So, so that means that the forces that are generated in this network due to chemistry, then in turn down-regulate chemistry, meaning that they, in this case, negatively suppress chemical reactivity. So this is the, I mean, as I said, most, uh, uh, I think most action in this field is experimental. So people, as maybe I'll just uh, go to slides, people do lots of detailed experiments and get lots of results. Uh, and uh, I think the role for the theorist is to, I don't think we're at the point where a theorist can really provide any sort of really realistic models of what the cell does at the level of even cytoskeletal dynamics are moving. The idea is to provide uh, interesting enough models based on what experimentalists have observed. So then we could generate some conceptual pictures that then experimentalists can use to think of maybe more experiments and so on. So, so, this, so in, in that sense, our role is to uh, simply help them try to maybe visualize and understand things at a microscopic level. That's often it's hard to do, hard to do that with experiment. So this is the model that uh, we have. We, uh, the way we model it, and, and Dr. Uh, Longcar, who is sitting uh, uh, at the back row, he, he developed uh, these models in the group, that you basically take the space and partition it into cubes of around 100 nanometer on the side. And in each of these cubes, you have discrete number of molecules. So you could have, for example, four actins, two capping proteins, three ARP2s. And these molecules can jump between the compartments. So, and, and at the micro scale, they jump stochastically. They might jump or they might not. So, so you have to sort of think of it as a random process. And then in addition to jumping around, which is like similar to diffusion in a macroscopic sense, they also can do chemical reactions, again, stochastically. For example, if you have uh, two molecules that can dimerize, then they might or might not in the next second. So, they, so there's also chemistry going on. And also they might or might not polymerize or depolymerize. And, and also when they do polymerize, it generates stresses that bends filaments and leads to, for example, decrease of polymerization rate. So even the rates of chemical reactions, they are not constant as usually are in chemistry, but they are dynamic. They are, they are dependent on what the system is exactly at this moment in time. <coughs> so we can, so, and, and then we have an elastic membrane interacting with these filaments and, and we can run either computer simulations, which are actually, we need uh, big supercomputers to run the simulations, or, or we can, uh, sometimes we try to actually develop simple analytical physical models and then check it with simulations to see if they agree. Um, this is just to give you a little bit more details on what, basically just saying what I just said, which is that we have all sorts of uh, processes like diffusion chemistry. We have lots of, we have looked at lots of molecules and chemical processes like capping, branching, and so on. And then we run Monte Carlo simulations. So next I'll, I'll show you a movie. It's a little bit older uh, result, but it, uh, from two years ago. 
But it basically shows that what happens when you run a single trajectory, again, this is all stochastic, so you have to run it multiple times, and then as you change your conditions, your reaction rates, your, the, you know, basically the chemical agents in your model, things will change, and you can look at how your system grows, for example, as you vary your parameters or your model. So in this case, you basically, the, the lines are the actin filaments and the red spheres are these branch points that are the ARP23 proteins, and then you see the membrane. So what can you do with a model like this in terms of, okay, we have that movie, so how can we, how can we use it actually to generate conceptual understanding and how we can start to connect it with experiments? <laughs> I'll show you just one result, and, and, and I think, uh, I hope to, I'll convince you that it's an interesting, for example, case where modeling can be useful. So there are proteins called capping proteins, and as the name suggests, what a capping protein does is if you have an actin filament, a capping protein comes and can cap, and then if it does, then this filament cannot grow. Well, so, so, so and then it, it will sit there for some time, and there is some unbinding rate, so after some time it will unbind, and then after, in, uh, after it unbinds, the filament can grow again. So in the simplest sort of macroscopic sense, then you say, okay, then I can think of these capping proteins as breaks, that you have a filament growth, the capping protein breaks the polymerization, it stops. So, so fine, doesn't seem like very exciting maybe. And then you say, okay, then if I have this polymerizing filament, and I put there a breaking agent that's going to stop it, Will it move faster or will it move slower? Obviously the answer is slower. And the, then you see from our simulations, the result is that initially it moves faster, that if you start from this left end of this picture, the, the vertical axis is speed, then as you add this stopping agent, the front, the, 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 the leading edge of the cell, it actually moves faster than if you didn't add this stopping agent. So that sounds strange. And then if you add more, then you slow it down. So then in the second part, it makes sense. Now you think that, okay, this is because your computer simulations are nuts. That, that, that just doesn't make sense. Except that uh, there are experiments on cells showing the same behavior. And, and so you put these cells and you add this capping protein or you, you, you upregulate them. And you see exactly this biphasing behavior that you start to add more capping proteins, they move faster. You add more, they move slower. And, and there are multiple sort of ideas in the biological literature for why this could be happening. Now, the good thing about simulations is that at least it's not clear. You, in simulations, you always never know that whether this is the real picture or not. But, but we see very similar behavior. And, and, and in our case, what we can do, we can go in great detail and analyze these simulations. And in our case, it actually makes, uh, uh, we can uh, explain why, at least in, 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 in our simulations, we get this result. So it turns out that uh, here's, the, here's the reason for why you see this result. So you have this lots of filaments, and these filaments, they grow and they push the cell forward. But for you, for these filaments to grow, the monomeric actin in the cytosol, in the solution, it, they have to be fed in into the growing ends. It's like there are these mouths that are eating this monomeric actin, and that means that they deplete actin in the front, so the actin from the back has to rush in by some sort of concentration gradient to, to come so, so you can maintain this growing front. So then, if you think about it that way, then what, then think about this network density. So you have an actin mesh. Think about an actin mesh that's very sparse, that's, or, or it's very dense. So what, 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 what would be the effect? Let's think first about the network being very sparse. If the actin mesh network is very sparse, you have relatively few filaments in the network, there is a mechanical problem because the membrane pushes back pretty hard. And, and remember that the growth rates are slowed down exponentially due to force. So because of that, your growth will be slow because there is too much load on each individual filament from the membrane. Then you say, why then you don't go to the regime where we have very dense network? Because if you have very dense network that membrane force is distributed on lots of filaments, each filament basically feels no force, and it seems that that would be the best case. That's not true. Because if you have, lot, if you have very dense network and you have lots of growing filaments, you have to feed all of them. And there is not, the transport capacity in the cell is not enough 
So the transport of monomeric actin from the back of the cell or the middle of the cell to the front where you need it becomes a big bottleneck. So you again grow slowly. So it turns out from this network density viewpoint, uh, there is actually an optimal density that you neither are too sparse nor you are too dense and that's where you grow the fastest and that's what capping protein does. It titrates it, the density. So you initially start with very too high density, like if you don't have capping protein, just the network self-organizes in such a way that from the viewpoint of protrusion speed, it's, the density is too high. Then you add capping protein, some of the filaments get capped. So you reduce the network density to the optimal level. That's when you get the maximum. This is the fastest growing speed. And then if you keep adding more, you make it too sparse and then mechanical forces overwhelm you. So this is, this is the picture that we can get and explain from simulations that's hard to get directly in a way that I described from experiments because in experiment you'll get a curve like this but you won't know what it means. So, so this is I think how the experiments and theory can I interact to uh, provide better understanding. So I think uh, I probably have two, three minutes or two minutes. So I'll, I'll just uh, tell you about uh, another types of objects we study uh, in the lab and these are HeLa cells which are cancer cells, you, you, some of you probably have uh, read the book about HeLa cells, uh, there are several books about HeLa cells, and, and, and there are these protrusions, might be hard to see, but there are these hair-like protrusions that are uh, somewhat <coughs> menacing, I guess, in this context, and, and they are actually related to aggressive cancer metastasis and so on. These things are called phallopodia, and they are based on, uh, they are based, let me show you actually in a, in a more, uh, 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 in a more uh, useful setting what philopodia do. So for example, when neurons have to find their targets, they extend the growth cone of a neuron, neuronal axon, extends lots of philopodia, and they are like scouting organelles that they go deep into the tissue and sense the environment. And they together transduce signals to the growth cone to tell it where it should turn. So for example, if, if the axon has to go from a brain to your finger, this is the mechanism it's, it's used. And philopodia emerge, although they are bundles, they are pseudo one dimensional bundles, they emerge from this 3D mesh. And uh, I'll, uh, maybe in the next 30 seconds, I'll just tell you that we also have this detailed mechanochemical models of philopodia growth where we, th these are like tubes, so you basically have a membrane tube and inside that you have this linear actin filaments that are growing. And, uh, and, and, and these filaments then interact with the membrane. And then one of the things we can do, we can run simulations and uh, what we see is, for example, that uh, <coughs> this philopodia, they grow to, they, f they grow very quickly, but then they stop growing and then they just fluctuate. And uh, we, uh, we developed actually simple analytical uh, theories that explain what determines the land to which these philopodia grow and how things like uh, active transport by motors like myosins can regulate the length of philopodia and, th and things of that nature. So, so these are kind of things that we do uh, in the lab and I hope that uh, at least I picked your interest in terms of uh, cytoskeletal dynamics and actin dynamics and cell motility being interesting subjects and also that this is where uh, biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics can meet and be quite productive. Thank you for your attention. So, and also in stereocilia, in your, in, in your ear, the, these are based also on actin structures like philopodia. And, and I think it's pretty clear that they treadmill. So that's, that's the thing. When you say static, to you it looks static. And, and actually this, this stereocilia, I think they can be, I think they are, they are there when you're born. And they stay like that for many, many decades, right? So that's the thing, is that you have something that looks like as if it's rigid and static and stays there for a uh, hundred years. But if you look into it, you'll see there's constant treadmilling. So there's chemistry and dynamics going on. So, so it's so precise in that sense that it's not really static in the sense that it's rigid and not doing anything. Right, 
Oh, that's a good question. So that's uh, so we are among the people that are looking into that. It's it's yeah. I don't think I can give you a simple answer, but 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 these kind of questions that we ask is how you in in, in a dynamically evolving structure like this, how do you regulate land? We've done some works. We have some formulas for it, but I'm not sure that at least in the case of stereocilia, right now I could give you a definitive answer. But but these are great questions to ask. That it's close to equilibrium? Basically, I mean, in all chemistry, all chemistry works essentially close to equilibrium. It works on very slow time scales relative to the actual chemical bond. And that which is, again, I think relevant to this whole question of how long does structure last and so on. So, in some sense, the whole thing is close to equilibrium, but the energy is good. No, I think what you're saying is absolutely right, but I think you, in that sense, I think you have to be, um, you have to sort of think of it at, the, at, at multiple land scales. And I agree that at the chemical land scale, it's probably very close to equilibrium, but often things at the land scale of the whole cell, it's really out of equilibrium. So, but the energies, they are small compared to the energetic scales, uh, to the chemistry scale. And, 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 and then if you go, you know, if you go to the electronic scale where you have heart trees, then it's all like tiny noise. So, so it sort of depends on what's the equilibrium in that sense is multi-equilibrium at different scales. And, and I think when I say far out of equilibrium, I think lots of processes at the level of the whole cell scale at, at the, in terms of, and, and chemicals, chemically speaking at the level of weak energetics compared to let's say uh, one EV. So at that, at, 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 in that sense, it's far from equilibrium, I think. But that's uh, but I don't have any good proof for it. Maybe we can talk more. Yeah. Uh, about how to understand these things, or <coughs> well, I mean, I think these these as I was, uh, I think it's actually relevant to the last question. Is that fossil record in some sense? It's uh, is something that hasn't been living for a long time. Uh, and you need, uh, and as we were saying about stereocilia, you do need this energy flow. Like you can look at the stereocilia in your ear, the hair bundles, and, and it looks like as if they are there all the time and they don't change. But in reality, you have to keep feeding energy there for them to stay at that land. Otherwise, they'll disappear. So, so, so if you have, unless you freeze that fossil in some special way, I, I have a hard time. I don't know, actually, if the actin structures would, be preserved over really long time scales. So these are pretty soft, sort of delicate and dissipative